While planning for the AT, something I worried about was if I would ever lose motivation to keep hiking every single day. I've heard this trail be referred to as the Green Tunnel by so many people, and that made me nervous that at some point I'd think that the trail would be too boring and that I'd want to go home. But now that I've completed the AT and experienced everything the trail has, I can confidently say that there are so many amazing things to see out there. Most every single day on trail, I had something to look forward to and keep me going. Whether it was a mountain, a view, town, hostel, landmark, or a state park, everything I was seeing during my hike kept me motivated to hike an average of 18 miles a day every day for 120 days in a row. I'm putting this video out to help anyone who wants to either learn more about what's out on the Appalachian Trail, anyone who needs a little motivation or excitement to get out there and hike, or to anyone who just wants to hear me reminisce about all my favorite AT spots one year later. I'm gonna go over state by state from Georgia to Maine. I know this is a long video, so feel free to listen to the audio while you do something else or skip around to the different sections using the timestamps I put in the description. So with all that said, I hope you enjoy. So the first state is Georgia. Starting out, the biggest thing I looked forward to when I started hiking in Georgia was hiking up and over Blood Mountain, which has a nice view. And then after that, hiking down into Neil Gap. This is exciting because it's gonna be the first place that you can resupply on the trail. You don't have to go anywhere. The trail literally goes right through the building. <laughs> so you can resupply there. It's a hostel, you can sleep there. You can get a warm meal, a cold drink. And it's just a fun place where hikers hang out. You can buy gear, there's a full gear shop. So if you've had a rough couple days on trail, there's a good chance that this place will have what you need to keep on going. Callie, why are you staring at me? So there's a couple of cool mountains and views to look forward to in Georgia, like Blood Mountain that I just mentioned, and also Cow Rock Mountain and Trey Mountain are beautiful places, but there aren't that many landmarks to look forward to. So I was getting excited about other things, like all the shelters on the trail. Like I said, this is my first backpacking trip and I wasn't that familiar with the AT, so every time I came up to a shelter, I thought it was so cool and I would stop and take a break there. And in Georgia, the shelters were pretty close together, um, maybe every seven, eight miles. So that was really fun for me. And then also every time I got to a gap that led to a town, I was excited because towns along the Appalachian Trail really motivated me. I really enjoyed going into towns and getting the luxuries like eating at restaurants and getting a nice warm shower. Those are just such feel good moments on the trail. So Georgia had some cool towns like Hiawassee, Clayton, and Helen that I've never been to, but I heard really fun things about that place. There's also a hostel in Georgia that I recommend. It's called Around the Bend Hostel, and that's at Dix Creek Gap, right before the North Carolina border. So for me, those first 78 miles in Georgia went by fast, and before I was new it, I was crossing that border into North Carolina, and that's, that's such a good feeling, crossing that first border. So now I'm in North Carolina, and I loved this state. So at mile 99, you're climbing up Albert Mountain, and this is a really fun climb because it kind of resembles the White Mountains for just a short amount of time, climbing up all these rocks and having the trail be really steep. And when you get to the top of Albert Mountain, if you get it on a good day, you can climb up a fire tower and have a 360 degree view. And also at that spot, you can celebrate because you just hiked 100 miles. So that was such a fun part of the trail. So after that, at mile 109, you get to Winding Stair Gap, and that was exciting for me because that is how I got into Franklin, North Carolina, which is a great town. If you like beer, they have a really good brewery in town. There's also good restaurants. There's a really good gear shop called Outdoor 76, that specializes in shoes and they can really help you get a good pair of shoes if you're having any feet problems on trail. I just love walking around Franklin. There's coffee shops, it's just a really good hiker town and I stayed at Chica and Sunset's Hostel both times I hiked through Franklin, which is one of my favorite hostels on the whole trail. Now past Winding Stair Gap, there's really good views on the trail. 
you go up and over a couple balds. You have Siler Bald, Waya Bald, and Wesser Bald, all from mile 113 to mile 130. At mile 136, the trail will go right through the Nantahala Outdoor Center, which is like an adventure resort. There's going to be whitewater kayakers there and hikers. There's a really good restaurant right on the river, so you can get some good food. There is a giant gear shop if you need any sort of gear. When I was there, I bought a new stove and a new pillow, and I was also able to send some gear that I didn't want anymore home, so that's super helpful. They have a really cheap hostel there that almost resembles a jail cell but if you just want to sleep inside and have a real bathroom for a night it does the trick. There's also nice hotel rooms there that I opted for because I'm a big fan of treating myself but all around this is a great place to just hang out, have beer, put your feet in the river and relax. A lot of people will talk about the climb after you leave the NOC going north and that's no joke, you have about 4,000 feet of elevation gain until you get to Chioa Bald, which is a good place to hang out. You get a view, it's pretty cool, and then after that it'll get a little bit easier. After you do this little section of trail, you will end up at Fontana Dam Road, and this is a fun spot too. Right at this road crossing, there's a marina where you can go and resupply, you can have a beer, and there'll also be someone there that could call a shuttle for you that will take you into Fontana Dam Village. There's a hotel here, there's cabins, there's a post office, there's a grocery store, and it's a great place to hang out. Um, I sat by the pool that day, I walked to the grocery store. When I was doing the trail in 2020, I took a zero there and it was really fun. A lot of people will stop at Fontana Dam Resort, but if you don't want to go to the resort and spend money, there's also the Fontana Hilton, which is a shelter in that area. It's free to stay, it's just like any sort of shelter that you come across on the AT, but it will have amenities there like bathrooms, showers, places to charge your phone. Um, I forget what else is there, but it's just a fancier version of your typical AT shelter, and a lot of hikers enjoy staying there. So a couple miles after this point, at mile 166, you then walk over Fontana Dam, and this is absolutely beautiful. You have a view of a giant lake. There's signs everywhere so you can learn about the dam. Both times I walked past the dam there was no one else there and it was just like a nice quiet relaxing place to just take it all in and I really enjoyed that. Right after you cross the dam that's when you see the sign that says entering Great Smoky Mountains National Park and congrats you made it to the Smokies. The Smoky Mountains are about 72 miles, and hopefully this is a highlight of your trip. The elevation in the Smokies gets a little higher, the terrain gets a little tougher, but for me it's just so rewarding being in the Smokies. So once you're in the Smokies, there's a couple landmarks to look forward to. You have Shushtak Fire Tower, you have Rocky Top. And the big one is Klingman's Dome. This is going to be the highest point of the whole Appalachian Trail, 360 degree views. It's a little side trail, but I think most every hiker will take it. And at this point, you have hiked exactly 200 miles. So for me personally, every time I hiked 100 miles, it's a huge motivation boost, really exciting to cross that, that point. And it never got old. I was even celebrating mile 2100. At mile 207, you'll get to Newfound Gap. This is a very populated area. It's a big tourist attraction. And if you want to go into Gatlinburg, Tennessee, this is where you'll get your ride. It's right in the middle of the Smokies. So if 78 miles for you is a little too long to go without a resupply, this is probably where you will get off trail to do that. I've never been to Gatlinburg, Tennessee, but I've heard some fun things about it. Um, it's definitely a good idea if you want a little fun on your through hike. At mile 211, I loved taking a really short side trail that led to Charlie's Bunyan. It had an amazing view. And by mile 238, 
you are at Davenport Gap and you can celebrate finishing the Smokies because that's where it ends. <laughs> Congratulations. After you leave the Smokies, the first place where you can kind of like treat yourself is at Standing Bear Farm. For me, this was an exciting place to look forward to. A shower, some frozen pizza, a light resupply, and just kind of like a little refresh after you spent so many days hiking through the Smoky Mountains. After that, at mile 255 is a big landmark. It's Max Patch. Um, as of right now, you cannot camp on top of Max Patch, but it's just a really big, grassy bald. A lot of good views, very popular for day hikes, and it was just something fun to look forward to because it's a place that I've heard a lot of hikers talk about. After Max Patch at mile 274, this is the first time that the trail goes right through a town, and this town is Hot Springs, North Carolina. There's plenty of places to stay there, hostels. The group I was hiking with at the time got a vacation rental with a hot tub. There are really good restaurants in town. There's a really good gear shop, a smoothie place. Hot Springs is where I ended my 2020 through hike attempt. And then in 2021, I took a zero day in Hot Springs. So I've spent a lot of time there and I definitely recommend doing that. Right after hiking through Hot Springs, I remember hitting mile 300 and also hiking up and over Big Bald Mountain. That was a really fun place for me. It was also a little unexpected. I didn't know a place like that was coming up and that's in the Cherokee National Forest. That was a fun little section of trail. After Big Bald Mountain, I remember hiking down into Irwin, Tennessee and staying at Uncle Johnny's Hostel. I had a really good time there, and in Irwin, there's a Dunkin' Donuts, and that just made my heart so happy. <laughs> After that moment, I looked forward to any time I could get Dunkin' Donuts on the trail. After Irwin, I was hiking on, I reached the Beauty Spot, which is a section of trail. I got it on a really foggy day, but I imagine this being a really beautiful spot. There's also Roan Mountain in this area, which is really high in elevation. This is one of the only spots on the whole trail that I saw snow, and it's also home to the highest elevation shelter on the whole trail. After that, you will cross Carver's Gap, which welcomes you to the Roan Highlands. This is a really cool section of trail because you go up and over a series of balds. I did this during sunset into the night, and it was such a pretty time. And then when it got dark, I would see like city lights out in the distance. After the balds, you hike down and you get to a sign that says leaving North Carolina. And that's really exciting because North Carolina was tough. <laughs> so now you are officially hiking in Tennessee, which is 74 miles long. Not too long after you cross into Tennessee, you'll get to a road called 19E. And from here, I went to a hostel called The Station at 19E, which was a really fun time. It was a hostel, but also like a restaurant, bar slash music venue. So I saw a music performance. I was able to play the piano, drink beer, get a lot of food, stay at a hostel, get a resupply. It was just a really fun time. There's also another place at that road crossing that you can look forward to called the Mountain Harbor B&B. And a lot of hikers look forward to this spot because it has the reputation of having the best breakfast on the Appalachian Trail. Now, I didn't stay there, so I can't confirm nor deny but I've heard some good things from my hiker friends. I remember the next section of trail after this spot having really good waterfalls to look forward to. So I decided to hike a little slower on this section to kind of stop at every waterfall and really appreciate it. I remember seeing Jones Falls, Mountaineer Falls, the Hardcore Cascades, but for me, the best was the Laurel Fork Falls, which was huge, and there was a campsite not too far away. So I saw the falls in the dark, because I got there pretty late, but also just having my morning coffee sitting next to that waterfall was 
one of the highlights of my trip. After the series of waterfalls at mile 428, I came across a lake called Wadauga Lake. This is a place where you can relax, swim, there's picnic tables, there's a beach. The Boots Off Hostel is right there, which is listed as one of the top five hostels of the trail. And if you're into it, I wasn't into it, but this is also a section of trail that you can aqua blaze, which means that you rent a kayak and you can kayak down the trail instead of hiking it. And right here, there's an option to kayak about 21 miles down the trail. So if you're into aqua blazing, that would be something super fun to look forward to. At mile 449, that's where the old barn with the big AT logo is. There's really nothing special about this barn, besides it's a good picture opportunity. And at mile 467, that is when you cross into Virginia. All right, so now we got to the point where we're in Virginia. This is gonna be a long section because Virginia is the biggest state of the AT. It's about 556 miles and there's a lot in Virginia. I don't think you need to get your Virginia blues walking through this state because I'm gonna tell you everything that you have to look forward to in this amazing place. So right off the bat, you enter Virginia, you only have to hike three more miles and you're in Damascus, which is Trail Town, USA. This is home of trail days where every year a lot of hikers will go back to Damascus and kind of celebrate for the weekend. There's a parade where current and pass through hikers will walk down the street and there's just a lot going on. I haven't been to a trail days before, but I would definitely love to go in the future. Now, Damascus is one of the towns that the AT just kind of goes through. For one and a half miles on the AT, you are walking through Damascus, and you'll pass plenty of different hostels and a couple restaurants and a gear shop. Also, if you're into biking, you might know about the Creeper Trail. So at this point of the trail, the AT and the Creeper Trail kind of merge for a little bit. I didn't really know what the Creeper Trail was when I walked through, and I still don't. But for some people out there, it's exciting, so maybe it is for you. At mile 498, there's a little side trail that will take you to the top of Mount Rogers, which I believe is the highest point in Virginia. So that's exciting if you're into that. And at mile 502, you cross Massey Gap which is kind of the entrance to the Grayson Highlands. And the Grayson Highlands is super exciting. It's something that I looked forward to because that's where you see the wild ponies. A lot of hikers will post pictures of the wild ponies and talk about them. I didn't know I was in the Grayson Highlands until I just came across a wild pony and it completely blew my mind. I was so excited and it's just a really fun section of trail. You never know when you're just gonna turn the corner and see a pony. After the Grayson Highlands at mile 534, you get to a shelter called the Partnership Shelter. And this is fun and exciting because it's one of the only shelters on the trail that you can call a pizza place and get delivery. When I passed that shelter, it was totally full. There were so many hikers taking advantage of that. If you're into history, you might get excited at mile 543 because that's where the Settlers Museum is. It's a museum that tells the story about the people who settled into Southwest Virginia and the unique culture that they had. Also in that area, there's a schoolhouse from the 1890s that was unlocked, I was able to go in and check it out, and that was pretty cool to see, and I think you can also camp there, so that might be a fun, unique place to camp on the trail. At mile 548, you'll see a sign saying that you hiked a quarter of the way from Georgia to Maine, and I didn't know that sign was there, but it was so cool to see that and think of the AT as a whole and that you did a whole quarter of it. So that was super cool. I remember this section of trail having good places to eat not far off the trail. So I remember going to like a Sunoco gas station and getting pizza. I also remember the Brushy Mountain Outpost and Trent's Grocery. So maybe now that you're a quarter of the way through the Appalachian Trail, you're starting to get that hiker hunger. You can get food a lot more frequently on this section of trail. So that was really nice. At mile 625, you'll get to one of the top rated hostels of the whole Appalachian Trail. This is the Woods Hole Hostel, and it's like an 1880s 
log cabin hostel in the middle of the woods. It's on a farm, there's animals. The host Neville is amazing and she's so nice. This is such a fun, unique hostel. Everyone raves about this hostel, so if you're in the area, if you do the Appalachian Trail, you should probably check it out. I know a lot of hikers that stayed there would definitely recommend taking a zero day there. Not far after that hostel, you get to Parisburg, Virginia, which is where I saw one of my favorite hostels, which was Angel's Rest Hikers Hostel. And this was one of my favorites because it was just a fun place. It was walking distance to Dairy Queen, a Mexican restaurant, a grocery store. It had really fun common areas, games, remote control cars. Mile 678, you cross the Kefir Oak Tree, which is going to be the largest oak tree on the whole Appalachian Trail. I thought it was cool. Maybe it's something that you'd look forward to. I just thought it was worth mentioning. Okay, now we're getting into one of my favorite sections on the whole AT. And if I had to go and redo a section right now, it would be this spot. And it is the Virginia Triple Crown. It starts at mile 702 when you get to Dragon's Tooth, which is a really like steep rock formation that was really fun for me to climb up. It was like different. It got me outside my comfort zone a little bit. And I sat on the top of this huge rock and watched the sunset. And then the next morning I watched the sun rise and I just absolutely loved it. 12 miles after Dragon's Tooth, you get to McAfee Knob, which is like the most iconic picture spot of the whole Appalachian Trail. It's like a little rock ledge that sticks out of the mountain and hikers will sit on that ledge and take photos. Again, I was here for sunset and sunrise, got amazing photos. You definitely have to look forward to this section of trail. It's, it's, it's a highlight. The third part of the Virginia Triple Crown is just five miles after McAfee Knob. It's called Tinker Cliffs. It's a cool section of trail, definitely not as cool as the first two, but it's worth hanging out a little bit. For me, it was absolutely way too buggy to stop and appreciate that section of trail, but it was pretty. You can look back and see I think McAfee Knob. So after the Virginia Triple Crown, you hike down and right past the town of Daleville, Virginia. This is not as extravagant of a trail town as like Damascus or Hot Springs, but there are things there. There's hotels, there's a gear shop, there's restaurants. And then past Daleville, this is where I saw the Blue Ridge Parkway for the first time. Now, Cody was really excited to see the Blue Ridge Parkway on the Appalachian Trail because he has driven that before, but for me, I had no idea what it was, so it was exciting to experience that for the first time. The trail kind of weaved in and out of the Blue Ridge Parkway for quite a while. Sometimes you walked right next to it, sometimes you wouldn't see it for a bunch of miles and then you'll cross it again. So there's a lot of pull-offs on the Blue Ridge Parkway that cars can pull over and look at the view. So you will get good views on this section. There was even one parking lot that had a big sign that said overlook of Taylor Mountain. So that was kind of special for me. At mile 829, you get to a shelter on the Appalachian Trail, but it's just not any ordinary shelter. This is the Priest Shelter. And what makes this shelter special and a little bit famous is that there's a logbook there that hikers will write their trail confessions in. And a lot of the confessions have to deal with poop. I poop in the wrong places. It's just things that hikers have done on trail that they feel like they need to get off their chest. And you can sit at the shelter and read all the confessions. It's very entertaining and it just gives your camp experience that night a little bit of excitement and it's not going to be the ordinary make dinner go to bed. At mile 864 you get to Rockfish Gap and this is a major spot on the AT because this is where the Blue Ridge Parkway is going to end and where the Shenandoah National Park is going to begin. At this point on trail, I got a ride into town and stayed at Stanimals Hostel and had a good experience there. So that 
point has a little bit of excitement. The Shenandoah National Park is about 104 miles. I really enjoyed this section of trail because it was a little different and I feel like it mixed things up a little bit. The terrain was not bad in the Shenandoah National Park. The hills were more like rolling hills and it was just like a nice easy stroll north for me. You weren't climbing up these big mountain peaks. Since it is a national park, you're going to see a lot of visitors there and you're going to walk past a few campgrounds. Some of the campgrounds will have camp stores open, which I think are called waysides. You can get food and drinks there and a couple extra luxuries like taking a shower and charging your phone. Shenandoah National Park is also famous for having a lot of bear sightings, so that will keep you on your toes. It was just overall a really nice experience for me walking through Shenandoah National Park. There was at one point a really big fancy hotel that is not really meant for hikers. It's more meant for like people coming on vacation. It was extremely overpriced, but I, I got a room there and I don't regret it. <laughs> After the Shenandoah National Park at around mile 996, you'll enter the Virginia roller coaster which is a series of a lot of up and down climbs on the trail, but I don't think it's anything super special. It might be something fun to look forward to, but it's not that fun when you're actually on it. <laughs> and this roller coaster section of trail will last about 14 miles. At this point of the trail, if you're a through hiker going northbound, you will have hiked 1,000 miles, which is incredible. It's such a great achievement. I don't think there's anything on the trail that says that you've hiked a thousand miles. You just kind of have to know and celebrate it on your own. When I walked through, it was painted on a tree, but I think they removed all of those. So who knows? It could change every year. So that's the end of the Virginia section. I know it's a lot, but to summarize, the things you can look forward to in Virginia are Damascus, the Grayson Highlands, the Virginia Triple Crown, the Blue Ridge Parkway, and Shenandoah National Park, just to name a few. So West Virginia starts at mile 1023 and only lasts for a couple miles. You're probably going to be pretty excited to see that sign entering West Virginia because you would have spent so much time hiking through Virginia that that state border is just going to feel huge. There's a couple things that happen in the few miles of West Virginia. You're going to walk over the Shenandoah River, and then on the other side of the river, you're going to walk past Harper's Ferry, West Virginia. Harper's Ferry is a very historic town. It's also kind of like the mental halfway point of the AT, so this is where a lot of flip-floppers will start their hikes. There's also an Appalachian Trail Conservancy building here that a lot of hikers will stop at and get their famous Polaroid photo taken on the outside of the building by the brick and the sign. It wasn't open when I went, but even when the building was closed, it was still exciting. So Maryland starts at around mile 1026 and lasts about 41 miles. And to be honest, I don't really have anything to say about Maryland because I hiked the whole state in 15 hours and wasn't paying much attention. But I'm sure if anyone's watching this and they are from Maryland or they know a lot about it, maybe you can comment down below different things that you can look forward to in Maryland and help people out there because I don't have any information for you. So Pennsylvania starts at mile 1067. And the first thing I noticed while hiking through Pennsylvania were that the shelters were so much better. They were big, they were clean. There were things there were like flowers and games and sometimes there'd be two shelters there. I think that's where the famous snoring and non-snoring shelters are. If you're into sleeping in shelters, I think you'll really appreciate the shelters in Pennsylvania. So this spot changes every year but the actual halfway point of the Appalachian Trail for me in 2021 was mile 1096. Around this area on trail you're gonna see a lot of different signs for where the halfway points were year after year. I remember seeing a sign from 2018, there was a bear carving from 2020, so like every mile or two on this section you see like a halfway point 
and it gets exciting every time. There's a tradition on the Appalachian Trail when you're halfway done with your through hike you eat a half gallon of ice cream and the most popular place to do this is in Pine Grove Furnace State Park. There is a general store there and they are fully stocked with ice cream for hikers to do this challenge with and they give out little spoon trophies if you do complete the challenge. When I hiked through Pine Grove Furnace State Park the general store was not open. I think it's only open a few days a week but there was a store not far after Pine Grove Furnace State Park called the Green Mountain General Store and they had ice cream too so that's where I did my half gallon challenge. It's a tough challenge but a lot of hikers look forward to doing that or at least attempting it. I think at this point the trail is being a little nice to hikers for once because at mile 1119 you walk through Cumberland Valley which is like the longest, flattest section of the whole trail. You walk through like different farmlands and down roads. I personally think that this section of Pennsylvania is lacking when it comes to fun landmarks and mountains to look forward to every day. So I was using the towns as motivation, which I usually did. This section of trail has three towns that the trail will go right through. We have Boiling Springs, Pennsylvania, which I loved. I thought it was just such a beautiful small town and the people there were so nice. There's also good food. There's also a Duncan in Pennsylvania which doesn't have the best rep but it's a town and you could stay there and eat there. I just don't think hikers always feel safe walking through that town for various reasons. And there's also Port Clinton, Pennsylvania which has more of the big box stores. There's a free shuttle that will take you to Cabela's and Walmart and you can get a lot done there too. And now we're getting into a northern Pennsylvania Pennsylvania, which is famous for the rocks, but there's a couple cool mountains and views in this section. The first one that comes to mind is the Pinnacle. This was a popular place to day hike. There was a great view, a lot of people, and there's also usually rattlesnake sightings there, so be on the lookout for that. After the Pinnacle, there's also Lehigh Gap, which is a huge mountain made of rocks. It just kind of goes straight up, you're bouldering up the rocks and you get a really nice view of I think Lehigh Gap or Lehigh River. It was, it was a fun little mountain to climb up. The last big landmark of Pennsylvania is getting to Delaware Water Gap at mile 1296 and that is where you cross the bridge over the Delaware River and enter New Jersey. So New Jersey is about 72 miles and you start off climbing up on a ridge and once you get on this ridge, for me it was absolutely beautiful. It was a beautiful day, I think it was like springtime and there were flowers and trees blooming everywhere and my first reaction of New Jersey was that it was really beautiful. There was Sunrise Mountain that I hung out at for a little bit and you also walk through High Point State Park which is home to the highest point of New Jersey. You can do a little side trail and see a monument up there and get a good view. And at mile 1358 you come to the famous New Jersey Boardwalk which is a nice easy mile or so of hiking because you're walking on a boardwalk through some wetlands and walking on a boardwalk is such a nice relaxing change of pace from walking in the woods. At mile 1368 you're gonna cross the state line and enter New York and not shortly after you pass into New York you start getting glimpses of the New York City skyline and for me I never really knew when this was coming up so just turning the corner on the trail and just seeing the New York City skyline was so cool and it kept happening like mile after mile and every time I would see the skyline it was like a bigger better view of it. Mile 1374 you come to a road crossing which was exciting because you can walk to an ice cream place called Bellevue Farm. It's known for having amazing ice cream and from here you could also get a ride to the Warwick Drive-In. It's a drive-in that allows hikers to set up their tents 
and camp there for the night. They also give you a little radio so you can watch the movies and listen to them. There's different amenities like you can charge your phone, use the bathrooms, and there's also places to walk to. I think there's a brewery, a pizza place, a grocery store. New York is also home to Harriman State Park and I enjoyed hiking through this state park. It was kind of tough if I'm remembering correctly and it also seemed like the type of state park that you would for sure see a bear but I didn't, but I was keeping my eye out for it. And towards the end of Harriman State Park, there's what they call the Lemon Squeezer, which you kind of walk through two giant rocks and you kind of get squeezed because it's really tight. And then there's a couple of tough rock scrambles after that. So things like that on the trail, for me, kept it exciting. And I really like the challenge of that. The Lemon Squeezer, for me, almost seemed like a very, very, very mini version of the Mohusik Notch in Maine, which I'll get to when we get to that point. But that is kind of like the slowest mile of the AT. When you do the Lemon Squeezer, just think when you get to Maine, it's just going to be a hundred times worse. <laughs> Mile 1404, you're going to be at Bear Mountain in New York. This is an extremely popular day hike. There were so many people there. Being a touristy spot on trail also had its perks because there were tons of vending machines, which kind of saved my day. I got a nice popsicle in the summer heat. And once you come off of Bear Mountain, you will see the Trailside Zoo, and the AT literally walks right through the zoo. You don't have to pay to go in, you can see all the animals, and for some hikers, this is where you're going to see your first bear on trail, or at least that's what it was like for me. So that was really cool. I don't know if a lot of people know before they set foot on the Appalachian Trail that you actually walk through a zoo. <laughs> Connecticut started at mile 14 of 58 and lasted about 50 miles. For me, I don't remember much about Connecticut. I think it went by pretty fast. I mean, I was only there for two days, but there are a couple spots in Connecticut where you can kind of take a side trail to go to town and buy some food. That's always exciting. At this point of your through hike, if you're in Connecticut, you really look forward to food. <laughs> I also remember getting a lot of trail magic in Connecticut just because it's a very populated state in the Northeast. You can probably tell at this point that these states are going by really fast, so you're crossing a state border every few days, and that is such a cool feeling. Every time I cross a state border, I'd be like, wow, I hiked all the way from Georgia to New Jersey, from Georgia to New York, from Georgia to Connecticut, and it never got old. Massachusetts starts at mile 1509, and it's another short state. It's going to last about 90 miles. I'm from Massachusetts, so I should have been super pumped and excited to be hiking through Mass, but I remember it being a little underwhelming. I think my vlogs from Massachusetts were kind of boring, to be honest, and I didn't have much to put in them. You can walk through towns like Dalton. It's a very populated area again, just like Connecticut. But for me, the most exciting part of the state was going up and over Mount Greylock, which is a big mountain. It's the highest point of Massachusetts, and it's going to take up a lot of northern Massachusetts. The climb up Mount Greylock is about like eight miles, and then the climb down Mount Greylock is about six, so it is a big chunk of the time that you're in Massachusetts. And then after Mount Greylock, you walk through North Adams for a little bit, and at this point you're just excited to get to Vermont. <laughs> At mile 1599, you enter Vermont, so you can enter Vermont and also reach another 100 mile marker at around the same time. This state border is a little more special because not only are you entering a new state, but you're also hiking on the long trail now because the long trail and the Appalachian Trail kind of merge for about 100 miles. Now that you're on the long trail, you might meet new types of people. You might meet some long trail end-to-enders, as they call it. So it might be a nice change of pace out there. In Vermont, you're going to be hiking in the Green Mountains. So the terrain is going to start to be a little tougher. You're going to start hiking more and more mountains. I remember Vermont having a lot of fire towers and ski resorts, and both of those equaled great views. At mile 1624, I saw the Glassenberry Fire Tower. At mile 1640, you see Stratton Mountain, which has a fire tower, and it's also a ski resort. 
At mile 1657, you get to Bromley Mountain, which is another ski resort, but this one is cool because at the top there's a ski patrol hut that they let hikers go in and camp and hang out. You can escape the weather if it's a bad day. It's just really nice that the ski mountain allows hikers to go in and use that when it's not the ski season. At mile 1697, you get to Killington, which is yet again another ski resort, so you get a good view. There's a little side trail that will lead you to the summit because the trail doesn't actually go up and over the summit. So if you want to do a 4,000 footer, you can do that side trail. That's an option. And then when you're getting further into Vermont, I remember seeing lots of beautiful ponds. And I went swimming a couple times there. I remember Griffith Lake and Little Rock Pond were both beautiful places. There was a campsite next to Griffith Lake, which was one of my favorite on the whole trail. I didn't know this was coming up, but at mile 1693, there's a sign on a tree telling northbound hikers that they have 500 miles left of their through hike. At mile 1704, you get to a road crossing that will lead you into Rutland, Vermont. I ended up staying at the Yellow Deli. I did not do my research on that place, but if you anticipate going to the Yellow Deli, I highly recommend looking it up before you stay there. It's not your normal hiker hostel. After Vermont is, of course, my favorite state, you enter New Hampshire. The state border is going to be on a bridge, and then right after the bridge, you're gonna walk through Hanover, New Hampshire, which is a big town. It's home of Dartmouth College, so there's a college campus there and a lot of different amenities. There's a really good grocery store there called the Hanover Co-op, I believe, and it's a great place to resupply. New Hampshire is going to start easy and then slowly get more and more difficult, so I think it's a good way to introduce yourself to the tough terrain of the White Mountains. The first peak that you're going to go over is Moose Mountain, which is only like 2,200 feet, and then after that you get to Mount Cube and Mount Smarts, which are a little taller at 3,000 something feet. And then, of course, after that, you have the famous Mount Musilaki, which is like the entrance to the White Mountains. It's your first 4,000 footer, and you're going to hike a lot of 4,000 footers in the state of New Hampshire. The climb down Mount Musilaki is really fun if you like a challenge. It's really steep, and it's right next to a waterfall, so the trail is usually pretty wet but I looked forward to this. I'm super familiar with this area, so if you have any questions about New Hampshire, just like ask me in the comments and I'll answer them for you. I've been thinking about making a video just about hiking through New Hampshire and like where to resupply and what the huts are like. So let me know if you're interested in that, if you have made it this far in the video. I don't know if I still have people's attention at this point, but hopefully someone's watching this. <laughs> I see New Hampshire as just groups of 4,000 footers separated by notches, which are kind of like gaps or road crossings or whatever you want to call it. So coming down Mount Musilaki, you will get to Kinsman Notch. And if you go into town, I highly recommend staying at the Notch Hostel. The owner is great. It's very hiker friendly, very well run, and you can also from there go into Lincoln, New Hampshire, which is like my favorite town. I work in Lincoln, I spend a lot of time in Lincoln, and whenever I'm in the Whites, I will most likely stop there and get some food. There's amazing restaurants. So from Kinsman Notch, you go up and over the Kinsmans, which are more 4,000 footers. Up there, you get a really nice view of Franconia Ridge, which I think is like the most epic section of the whole Appalachian Trail. It's so scenic up there. Coming down the Kinsmans, you will enter Franconia Notch. If you want to go into town, the side trail to the parking lot is about a mile, so keep that in mind. But from here, you go right up to Franconia Ridge. You see Little Haystack Mountain, Mount Lincoln, Mount Lafayette, Mount Garfield, uh, places I've been so many times, but the views never get old. Just walking above the tree line in the White Mountains is, I think, something special. After Franconia Ridge, you walk through more 4,000 footers, obviously, like South Twin. There's also Zealand, which is a 0.1 mile side trail, 
but I recommend this. It's a nice little spa area to eat lunch if you want. And this is also where I saw my first pine marten, which are the cutest animals to look at. <laughs> After this, you'll hike down into Crawford Notch, and that section that you just did from Franconia Notch to Crawford Notch is like the longest section in New Hampshire that you will not cross a road, and that section is pretty tough. From Crawford Notch, that is where the presidentials start. You'll hike right up the Zealand Cliff Trail, which is short and steep. Once you get up there, you get great views and you start doing more 4,000 footers, obviously. There's Mount Jackson and Mount Pierce. Some of the 4,000 footers in the presidential range, the AT doesn't go up and over. It kind of like skirts around the side but you're more than welcome to take the blue blazes up and over the peaks of these 4,000 footers. Some of them are worth it, like Eisenhower, Monroe. Right before you get to Mount Washington, you will see the Lake of the Clouds hut, which is such an iconic hut. I think it's the only hut above treeline, and you get an amazing view of Mount Washington. The sunrise there is really good. Mount Washington is such an insane place to hike to. There's going to be a lot of people up there because you don't have to hike to get to the summit of Mount Washington. You can take a train or you can just drive up there. So just warning hikers, it's going to be very populated up there. So if that's not your thing, you can just keep on going. But Mount Washington is really cool because it is the windiest place on earth. Like I think it has that record of having the strongest wind ever recorded by man. There's a museum up there. There's a cafeteria. There's the iconic Mount Washington sign that if it's a busy day, you have to wait in line <laughs> to take a picture of. But most of the time I end up waiting, even though I've been up there like, I don't know, four or five times before. After Mount Washington, there's still more of the presidentials that you have to do. There's Mount Jefferson, Adams, Madison, and then you hike down a really long ridge until you get to Pinkham Notch. Once you hike into Pinkham Notch, there's a visitor center, there's the Joe Dodge Lodge, there's going to be a restaurant, and hiking into that restaurant, it's not common in New Hampshire to be able to walk to a restaurant from the trail, so take advantage of that, because I did. After Pinkham Notch, you got one more mountain range in New Hampshire to hike up the Wildcats and the Carters. Hiking up the Wildcats has the reputation of being the steepest mile of the AT. A lot of hand and foot climbing up rocks, which for me is really fun. The top of the Wildcats, you get to a ski resort, you do a few more 4,000 footers, the Carters, Mount Mariah, and then you hike down and the Rattle River Hostel is going to be right on the trail. So that's a really convenient place to stay. And congrats, you just hiked in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. And after the Rattle River Hostel, you still have 17 more miles in New Hampshire, but honestly, it's pretty uneventful compared to what you've just done. All right, so now that you're in Maine, you're probably thinking like, wow, I'm almost done with the trail. Like, I don't need any motivation to keep going. Like, Katahdin is my motivation. Um, wrong. <laughs> For me, Maine was the toughest state on the whole Appalachian Trail to find motivation to keep going day to day because at that point of my through hike, I was so tired. I was over it. I was just like in a bad mood for most of the state. The first big highlight of the trail when you start hiking in Maine is at mile 1917, and that's the Mahusik Notch. I mentioned it a little bit earlier in this video, but Mahusik Notch is one mile long, and it's the slowest, most challenging, but also like most fun for some people mile of the whole Appalachian Trail. You're hiking like through a notch in between mountains and it's just a giant boulder field and underneath the boulders like you're so far down that there's still snow in there in the summer and it's kind of chilly. Um, but yeah, there's these boulders everywhere and you're climbing up and over them. You're climbing like under them into caves and you're trying to follow the blazes, but like the trail is just one big giant mess. 
and that's a really exciting thing to just go through. It's a huge change of pace. You're not like walking through the woods or up and over a mountain. You're just kind of rock scrambling and it's just like a giant adult playground at that point. The Mahusik Notch for me it took a couple of hours and then after Mahusik Notch you do a climb up a mountain called Mahusik Arm and then once you get over that you get to Spec Pond which I absolutely love. It's a gorgeous alpine pond and there's a shelter there and it was just a fun place for me to camp. It was one of my favorite places. Just like New Hampshire, there's a lot of different mountains in Maine that you're gonna go up and over, some 4,000 footers. I'm not as familiar with these mountains like I am New Hampshire, but in Maine, you're going to get some amazing views from mountains like the Bald Pates, the Saddlebacks, the Bigelows and Crocker Mountain are the ones for me that really stick out. At mile 1972, you're gonna cross a major road and that road can take you into Rangeley, Maine. And I 100% recommend doing that. I love Rangeley, Maine. So these mountains that you're gonna go up and over in Maine, some of them are above tree line, just like the Saddlebacks right after you go to Rangeley, Maine. Those are absolutely beautiful. Mile 2041 is really exciting because that is where the AT crosses the Kennebec River. This is a really big river that kind of has a strong flow. It's kind of deep. It is 100% not recommended to ford the river. Instead, there's certain times throughout the day that there is a ferry service, which is just a guy rowing a canoe, and the actual Appalachian Trail route is on that canoe so they put a blaze on the bottom of the canoe mile 2078 you get to a road that goes into monson maine and in monson maine is shaw's hiker hostel and one of the best hiker hostels on the appalachian trail i had such an amazing experience there the owners hippie chick and poet are just so nice, so helpful. They really know what they're doing there. There's really nice places to stay. You can tent in their yard. They have a gear shop. And this is gonna be like the last place that you can resupply before you get into the 100 mile wilderness. And those two are so smart. If you have any questions about the 100 mile wilderness or need any sort of help, um, they will help you. So that's a really, good spot to go on your through hike even if you don't need a place to stay or you don't need a resupply it just it was a really special place so right after monson that's when you enter the 100 mile wilderness the last big section of the appalachian trail this section of trail was really tough for me mentally just because i only had a couple days left in my through hike and the bugs were just absolutely driving me crazy. But so many hikers have such a fun time in the 100 mile wilderness. The terrain is not bad at all. There's lots of really pretty lakes in there and you can camp on the lakes. It's beautiful. You will probably see a moose in the 100 mile wilderness, so that's really exciting. And every so often, you get to see a view of Katahdin. I would always go into the Gut Hook app, which is now called Far Out, and look at the comments, and people were saying at which exact points you can see views of Katahdin. That specific part really kept me motivated in the 100 mile wilderness. You leave the 100 mile wilderness at mile 2178, and you walk across Avall Bridge, which is going to be your best view of Katahdin so far. There's a little shop there, so treat yourself because you just hiked 100 miles in the wilderness. You probably need some food, need a nice cold drink, and it's a really fun place to hang out because after that, the trail is a piece of cake until you have to climb up Katahdin. And it was so nice at that point to actually see civilization. So like people and cars and just like things happening in the world. Because when you're in the 100 mile wilderness, you see nothing but like trees and lakes and views and not many people. So after a ball bridge, you're walking through Baxter State Park from mile 2178 to mile 2187. And it's really flat miles. So it's just a nice fun stroll. After that little stroll, you're going to get to Katahdin Streams Campground where you can check in with the ranger and have a place to stay that night. And then the next day, 
you're hiking Katahdin. Like, that's incredible. Um, so I don't think you need any motivation to hike Katahdin. I think you got this. Like, the end of the through hike, that should be enough. But if you want some extra excitement, try doing Knife's Edge. So I know that was a lot. I know I just talked your ears off for who knows how long this video is. I've had to start and restart my camera so many times. I've been filming this for like two days. <laughs> So those were my highlights of the Appalachian Trail and the places on the trail that really motivated me and kept me going day after day. And hopefully you're getting excited to see some of these places if you're planning a through hike. And if you have done a through hike and I missed something huge, of course mention that in the comments so we can help each other out. Thank you for watching. This is by far the longest video I've ever put on YouTube. So I just want to give a round of applause to everyone who is still watching this at this point. Happy hiking! I'll see you in the next video. Bye!